composition, some building blocks for quantum semantics. This is me, Dominic Widows, and it's work with colleagues Darway and Chase. And, well, here we are. And we work for IonQ. We make quantum computers out of trapped ions. So start with thanks and much appreciation to the conference organizers. I think for a lot of us, this is, you know, our first social outing to a conference in, uh, well, two or three years, in fact, for, for me since the last time I was, well, not standing here, but standing there, but otherwise very, very similar. Uh, so huge thank you, and thank you for the wonderful like, setup here and the conference dinner and the wonderful choice of wines last night, and thank you all for making it here this morning, given the wonderful choice of wines last night. So so going to talk about, well, quickly, why are we interested in quantum AI and NLP, but we are all interested in quantum AI and NLP, so I probably don't need to convince you. That'll go fairly quickly. Um, mathematical background, vectors, tensors, projections, similarity. Again, that'll be quick, because you lot know it. Of course you do. Um, um, language background, there's some interesting stuff, partly just in how long we've been using vectors in language that we sometimes forget today. So I'll go over that very quickly. And then the main meat of the talk is the near-term advances, the composition with qubits. And we have, well, I've got an additive application, a sequential application. This one's for bag of words topic classification. This one's for bigram modeling. And there's one at the bottom, uh, ambiguity resolution, which should be there. So why is quantum AI interesting? Well, there's all sorts of reasons people talk about. There's building some sort of real General intelligence is a core goal of computer science anyway. And there's reasons for believing that quantum models, quantum computing, will fill crucial roles in truly intelligent systems. There's all sorts of reasons people have said this. There's, you know, Roger Penrose is perhaps the most famous for taking very literal approach to quantum cognition being literally quantum processes in the brain. Uh, but there's other things that you know, we know that humans have access to much more information than we ever use. And if I just look around the, the room, you know, the number of photons hitting my eyes, the number of people I'm seeing, but apparently I'm processing something like 40 bits a second, according to some psychology experiments. And so we're astonishing at taking in lots of information, um, but only really accessing or using or thinking about a relatively small amount of it. Uh, so. This, these could be word meanings and associations. It's astonishing how many meanings and associations words have, and very few of them trigger at once because we don't need them all at once. And this starts to sound a little bit familiar. You've got two to the n variables, but you can only measure n bits. Oh, yeah, that's something of an overlap. I mentioned a word may, may have many potential meanings, and we pick one in context. And by a structural analogy, this is like measurement in quantum mechanics. And when I say a structural analogy, I mean it to sound, you know, a little bit, well, that's just an analogy, yes. Uh, it's also an analogy that's been used for, to describe prices in economics. It's that you don't really know what the price of something is until you strike a deal and money changes hands. I know we have price tags on things nowadays, which kind of makes us forget that. But it, you know, as soon as we're actually negotiating the price of something that isn't mass produced, then you know, of course, prices are things that come into, ex you know, come into existence by transactions, which are a kind of measurement. And decisions in psychology have been described very similarly. It's not that you know what decision you're gonna make in advance and then, you know, so someone asks you and you tell them the decision you had already made. But making decisions is an interactive process between us and the environment that we're operating in. And also, we very quickly access information when we need it, even if this is unexpected. Now, this is something that computer systems in general have failed to do. We have a very component, ball and spoke, you know, inputs and outputs approach to software design, computer design, building components, 
Now, of course, that's not the only way we build software nowadays. In fact, that's the, you know, to some extent, the traditional difference between the stack and the heap. But we still don't have very good computational models for, oh, I didn't realize I needed this information, but I need it now, I'll go and get it. And if any of you have experience trying to get state that you didn't have in a distributed system that wasn't designed to give you that state, it's miserable. And, and something like any-to-any -any connectivity could be crucial here. And so that's not just quantum computers or all of them, it's thinking about the topology of quantum computers and is that something that we really need to think about from the point of view of intelligence if we're going to build intelligence. So, a bunch of interesting overlaps. Okay, so now I'll skedaddle through the background. And when I say mathematical background invitation, what I mean is it's an invitation to, you know, if I go over any of this too quickly, you know, love to talk about it for hours during breaks, etc. So anything in the next few slides that I go over too quickly is really asking, come and talk to me afterwards if, if you've got time on your hands. So, we know that quantum states and wave functions are represented by vectors, you know, Fourier series, all that good stuff. And quantum operators are represented by matrices or tensors that act on state vectors. And matrices are not exactly the same as tensors, they're rather more impoverished. It's so something that we should discuss more in AI at the moment because uh, tensors have become all the rage in AI but we're often not thinking of them as any more than matrices, and in particular, you can't do duals that way. Uh, just quick thought experiment. Uh, you're probably used to the idea of a scalar product. You can represent it as a column vector multiplied by a transpose column vector. Try turning any column vector into a transpose using matrix multiplication. Dimensions don't add up, you can't do it. So you actually can't develop a full vector calcu calculation system that does all the things we're used to doing with vectors with just matrices. So that's an interesting motivation for actually looking into what tensors really are and duality and the sort of type arity. And, and I need to keep moving on because this is not meant to be a math talk. Right. Oh. So when we perform a quantum measurement, the probability of each outcome is given by the square of the scalar product. So th that's the probability amplitude. And this is cosine similarity in AI and machine learning. We're great at using different names for the same things. And this leads to a whole logic of projection operators. And this, this quantum logic is non-local, non-distributive, and having already rambled a bit too much about mathematics, again, if anyone wants more on what do you mean by non-local and non-distributive, and why is it a logic, love to talk about it. OK. Word vectors since the 1960s, I tend to pop this in because we don't often don't realize how long we've been using vectors. And so the idea of using term document matrices for information retrieval started in the 1960s, or at least is documented at least as far back, I dare say, they were talking about it earlier. And, I'm, and Keith Van Riesbergen is a wonderful source of information on this, and a shout out to Keith as being perhaps one of the grandfathers of this community. Um, and so how do we build an information retrieval system using matrices? We go over a corpus of documents, we count how often each word occurs with e in each document, we record those scores in table cells like this, and oh, look, as soon as I've got a whole row of numbers, I can multiply them by a uh, scalar, which we often do for term weighting. I can add them together, which we do to create so-called document vectors. And then you can do cosine similarity between this sort of weighted sum of term vectors and queries and documents and build an information retrieval system. Of course, a ton more goes into building you know, one of today's big modern search engines, all sorts of things like, all sorts of things that I'm not going to talk about this morning. Do not digress. All right. Uh, but one of the early information retrieval systems, by the late 90s, uh, late 80s, uh, we were doing all sorts of other things with these matrices. You can project them down to get more information. Well, no, to compress the information and bring things together using singular value decomposition or more recent techniques like uh, we mentioned late in Dirichlet 
analysis yesterday or a non-negative matrix factorization uh, because as in probability, uh, people are sometimes really perturbed by the fact that singular value decomposition creates negative entries. I almost find it perplexing that people are perturbed because, you know, well, first axis is a best fit curve, best fit line. Other things may be above or below the line. I, of course, you get negative coordinates, but people do seem to find that very strange. And, but it's not just these vector search models, that also the connectionist models that have become the enormous juggernaut of neural networks in AI today. They were around in the 1980s. Uh, they didn't scale very well, so you know people lost interest to something. Well, that's unfair. They were not widely used. And, and of course, the computational scale of by you know, 2013, then neural network ways of building semantic vector spaces became very big very quickly, like took the community by storm and now everyone is using word vectors or even like character vectors and collections of character vectors and so-called contextual embeddings. I do find it somewhat unfortunate that the term embeddings rather than vectors were used for this because it's led to a whole way of talking about this field that makes people think it started in 2013. That's a problem, not just because I'm a bit old and grumpy about it, and we were talking about it long before it was fashionable. I, I am a little bit old and grumpy about it, but the real reason I'm bothered by this is we thrown away a lot of things that had to be reinvented later, like, for example, the projection logic, or indeed this strange belief that percolates the NLP community and is often re repeated that, oh, you can't use a vector to represent an ambiguous word because it's just a point. That's just fundamentally not true. It's plain wrong. Yes, vectors go directly back to Euclid's axioms in a beautiful way, so a point is that which has no parts. Yes, but we've done so much more with vectors since then. We have, you know, it's almost as if the language community, it sometimes feels like the language community, the NLP community, is caught up with Euclid and not got as far as Fourier, which is strange. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that, uh, the, yeah, if I was going to talk about this particularly, yeah, Paul Smolensky's work on that role filler binding in the late 80s, using that for slot filling, filling syntactic structures. And they're still doing, like Paul's group is still doing fantastic work today. They were, gave a wonderful talk in the Vector Symbolic Architectures group recently. And yeah, that's wonderful stuff. Because the other ones are not doing that. That's true. Um, well, yes. Yeah, quite right. Um, and. And the, yeah, the neural net composition, the things that we're using, like for those in sort of BERT kinds of models are generally not taking syntax very, very seriously. All right, um, so I s popped this in, so, so let me, I, I do wanna talk about what we're doing now, but Bob reminded me last night that there's a whole background here that you know some of us take for granted because we've been friends and talking about these things for a long time. Uh, but let me quickly mention, my, my interest in word vectors started in the early 2000s. I was lucky enough to get a postdoc after uh, working in pure mathematics, working on this high dimensional representations for machine learning and language. And one of the first challenges I faced was this comment uh, semantic vectors, they can only do similarity and addition. You can't call that semantics. You can't even do negation. Uh, that was the first day I met Oliver Lemon, who was one of my colleagues at uh, CSLI at, at Stanford. And it was a perfectly friendly chat over coffee. And then we started playing guitar together. It was, uh, his, uh, and, but I thought, what a good point. You can't do negation, you know, challenge accepted. Well, we can do negation. Uh, if you want to get a vector for something like A not B, well, then it should have no similarity with B. You've removed the B parts. Okay, well, how do I make sure two vectors have nothing in common, no similarity? Oh, I can do that with orthogonal projection. Well, 
shall we try it? Well, of course we did. And it, it worked very well for re removing unwanted meanings from, from search results. Uh, you don't just remove the unwanted word, you remove a lot of neighbors of the unwanted word. And it worked for word sensitive ambiguation experiments as well. And so it took a couple of years to publish. Uh, how can something so simple take such a long time to publish? Uh, it, it, it took a while, the whole like, you know, evaluation, results, is it really working? Do people like it? No, okay, more evaluation, more results, do people like it? Yeah, yes, okay, then we got it published, good. And it was very fortunate that we did because I got this wonderful piece of feedback from, I think it was Larry Moss at uh, Indiana, uh, saying, you do know there's prior art for this. And I was like, oh, oh no, this is bad. This, this means someone's done it before. It probably came out at ACL 2002 and it's 2003 now I've been scooped. Like, no, it's been done before by these people called Burkhoff and von Neumann from 1936. And I was just like, I wasn't quite who are they, because, you know, I, uh, but mainly knew about von Neumann from non von Neumann boundary conditions in my differential equation course. Uh, and was, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, they did something in quantum mechanics. Is it, is it related? And you know, uh, here we are 20 years later talking about quantum AI and word vectors. And, and raised just an interesting little thing on, well, by negation, do we mean things that are perpendicular or things that are opposite? And, well, yeah, it could be both. Um, here's my suit vector which is a super combination of clothing and legal meanings. If I project it, if I want suit, not lawsuit, not the legal meaning, then I project it down onto the clothing meeting, uh, the clothing axis. And, and it, it's just interesting that we, that does raise the question when we say negation or opposite, should things be opposite or should things be orthogonal, uh, we use both pictures in quantum mechanics that, you know, these are orthogonal vectors and we represent them as antipodal points on the block sphere. All right, so why are people interested in this right now? The real reason, well, one of the big reasons, we've been doing these things with quantum models for a long time, but now we have quantum computers for real. And that's what's made the last couple of years, this sort of uptick in excitement. It is a great time to be working in this field. It's so exciting. And so this talk's going to be principally about the new things that we're doing on quantum computers. I mentioned IonQ makes quantum computers using trapped ions. And most circuits in this talk were run on an 11 qubit machine though the, some of the things in the bag of words classifier I scaled up to 20 qubits for the first time last week. It's all, all happening at the moment. And, and so the field is moving from theory to practice very quickly. So we talked yesterday about you know, some of the algorithms that we've had for you know, 30, 35 years but they've been theoretical algorithms, just in the sense that, you know, we had celestial mechanics for hundreds of years before space flight. It's not bad to do theory before practice, uh, but we can do it for real now. And so the, the field's moving from theory to practice very quickly. I'll say it's a good time to be perfectly opportunistic that you, for the next couple of years, we're going to be able to ask, oh, has anyone done this on a real com quantum computer yet? And if they haven't, go ahead and do it, because in a couple of years' time, yes, they will be all running on quantum computers. And this is really important for us to do. So, yes, everything runs on simulators as well so far. And so my development process is not I have a you know, quantum computer sitting on my desk that I play with all day. I still, generally speaking, not always try things out in simulation first and make sure everything runs before I start submitting jobs and you know, waiting for, for results, etc. cetera. Um, but, but the simulation has become just one of the development steps. It's like saying, okay, my, my code compiles. Well, yeah, but does it run for real yet? And now that it can run for real, you know, let's be doing that. And, and it's also enabling us to think and talk about what do we really mean by quantum advantage? 
I think one of the things I find myself not liking is when we talk about quantum advantage, because there are quantum properties that can change complexity classes of certain processes from exponential to polynomial, it encourages us to think quantum advantage means some, changing something exponential that doesn't actually run yet to something polynomial that still doesn't actually run on a quantum computer yet. So there are so many other things that are advantages of quantum computers, like two to the, like two to the n variables in n, n qubits. Like that, that's my quantum advantage right there. My job is to use it. And that's not the only one. Um, and so that's really, uh, you know, if there's any takeaway sort of encouragement, I'll probably dwell on this point again at the end just to emphasize it. Um, like the, one of the biggest contributions we can be making the next couple of years is running things on real hardware. And before anyone says, well, that's easy for you to say, you work at one of these companies that's got one of these computers. Uh, like look up IonQ research credits. That is one of the ways that you can start running circuits on real hardware. Uh, there's an upcoming deadline on June the 30th for proposals. Uh, so if there's something you'd really like to get running on a quantum computer, like do chat with me afterwards, do apply. Like this is something that we can all be contributing to. All right, so the near-term advances in you know, composition with qubits, the actual meat of the talk. What have we done on these quantum computers? Okay, we're doing this right now. And so first example, bag of words classification. And what do I mean by classification? In this context, classifying texts to topics, standard NLP challenge. Uh, we use it for all sorts of things like uh, sometimes keyword tagging, uh, sometimes customer service, like message routing, intent classification in dialogue systems. There's all sorts of parts in language processing systems where they do some sort of classification. And, and this is something that has been run on quantum hardware. That's one of the exciting things between the last time we were here and this time. So shout out to the team at Cambridge Quantum Computing, as it was then, Continuum now, for really getting the ball rolling here. Not just in doing the experiments, which is great, fantastic, and but also releasing the Lambeck package and the data set. So there was me looking around for, how can I finally, uh, where's there a data set that you know, I can use for classification experiments that's you know, big enough to be interesting, small enough to be real, and already has, you know, ideally, someone else has done the work and, uh, and someone else has, you know, you have prior art to follow. So thank you very, very much for that contribution. And so here we extend this work with alternatives. And if you think about NLP from the point of view of linguistics, it's very natural to think about meaning in terms of syntax and semantics. There's a long tradition in linguistic theory of, in logical semantics, of building semantic representations on top of syntactic parse trees or some syntactic form. And that's one way of doing it. And coming from an information retrieval background, naturally, I did something grubbier. <laughs> In information retrieval, we don't normally think of syntax and semantics. Uh, we normally think of, well, you know, term weighting and relevance. Those are the sorts of topics we talk about. So naturally, from that point of view, if I'm gonna try and build a classifier, it's like, you're not gonna just split the words up and then assign numbers to them and add them up and hope something good comes out. Of course I am, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So, partly, that's a good, interesting challenge because it raises some good mathematical questions as well. How do we add classifier weights? 10 minutes left? All right, good, okay. So, in that case, I'll get through this quickly. Uh, one of the things we often do in, not just in classifiers, but in neural networks of all sorts, is adding weights. Uh, so, for example, suppose that bread and butter both have high scores for being related to food, then bread and butter together should have an even higher score. Right. So, this task's done using partial rotations and CNOT gates, 
And you know, this uses the famous you know, in-between states that single qubits can have, unlike classical bits. We perhaps talk about that too much. You know, it's too popular to say, oh, quantum computing can represent in-between states. Yeah, so could analog computers between the 50s and 80s, and then we stopped using them because floating point arithmetic was fast enough and accurate enough. But it is one of the benefits of uh, quantum computers. And so if I build a circuit like this, uh, it turns out after a bunch of maths, it produces outputs like that, which as you can see here around the origin, you know, are going uh, monotonically increasing in both of these angles, but it produces interesting shapes as we go globally. Um, and you can represent single qubit rotations using quaternions. Uh, it's really easy to take fractional powers of quaternions using De Marvre's theorem, and then you can build up different algebras using different quaternion generators and make all these pretty patterns. And, and I could stare at these for days. And uh, so, but I have not just gone back to being a quaternionist and studying this the whole time, much as I would be tempted to. Uh, so how do we build this into a classifier? Well, during training, okay, we picked the nine most salient words in the corpus, so that a lot, you know, not a lot, a little bit of manual tweaking there. Uh, again, sort of simulation, development process, get it working, then run it. And so during training, we go through the corpus, so for example, if you had just two words, you'd do those two rotations. Then during classification, when you see a new word, uh, a new document, you connect it to a sum, classify a bit for each of the topics, and then just see which of these sums wins in the sense of when you measure them, like which gets the most ones over a number of shots. And that worked very well, uh, you know, and first off had to run it in two different runs, like nine qubits per topic, so that was two jobs, combine them afterwards, uh, but now I can run it all in a single, single run, and it produces the right results. Yay! All right, moving on. Biogram sequences and distributions. So if the composition in the last one was, well, the only composition that's going on really is adding things up. Uh, going back to Oliver's original complaint, well, that's not really semantics, you're just adding stuff up. Well, it's a part of semantics that we need to be able to do, but we shouldn't stop there. So, bigram sequences and distributions. Okay, started with one, moved up to two. Very bottom-up bottom -up approach going on here. And, um, but even bigrams in language are interesting in themselves, not just for building language models for like Markov model parsers and things like that, but for example, in dialogue systems, uh, arrange accommodation, book room, reserve hotel, make reservation. They're all different ways of saying the same thing. And one of the things we don't even note necessarily is book and make, for example. They're not synonyms, but they are in book a room or make a reservation. So how did we model this? There's a whole literature on modeling joint distributions using quantum probability. Uh, you collect example pairs, so you know red apple, green apple, yellow banana, uh, encode as a state vector, and then you take the outer product of it with itself, take partial traces using the density op operator, and the interesting thing you come out with, which is different from classical marginalizing a classical joint probability, is, oh, these off-diagonal elements. Oh, red and green have some sort of relationship between them. That's very nicely described in quantum probability. Uh, Here's going through the steps in more detail. More to say it really is that simple rather than it really is that complicated. That is all you have to do in this experiment. And, and so then we approximated the small distribution with a quantum generative model. And interesting thing about that just we, was noise in the image blurring was mentioned yesterday. We actually got better results fitting this distribution by allowing there to be some noise. And then we actually want to use this for generation as well. And then we asked this sort of noisy fit to start saying, OK, tell me other plausible phrases. And you know, it had been given black shoes to begin with. And it came out with things like you know, brown shoes, good. Also came up, you know, occasionally we got some you know, strange things like you know, purple apple. Yeah, you don't get that for real. But there's plenty of opportunity to scale this up and start doing like more thorough evaluations on the generative process. 
finish with ambiguity resolution. Ambiguity, hallmark of language, it's the rule, not the exception. It's very nice to leave ambiguity in the corner and say, oh, well, let's just assume everything's disambiguated before we start doing our clever syntax and semantics, because ambiguity is, you know, it's a side issue. It's not. Ambiguity is everywhere. More than half of the most common words in it, uh, most common verbs in English are nouns as well. But we don't even think of them as, you know, we syntactically dis disambiguate them and don't think about that. All right. Um, we've been using vectors, have a long history with ambiguity. How long do I have left? About two minutes? All right, great. Fine. And a uh, particular shout out to Henrik, uh, who was uh, the founder of the project, well, in fact, started the work at Stanford on vectors that I was lucky enough to get to continue. And we were looking at, so it was Henrik's work on word sense discrimination that led directly to us trying to find that em empirically in the orthogonal negation work. And, and composition helps to resolve and sometimes demonstrate ambiguity. So like set, point, set, line, like these mathematical words, the words we use in mathematics are also some of the most ambiguous words in English. So set theory or set yogurt, set square, set winner. This is like tennis, carpentry, you know, they're, they're all different. And we don't think about that often. We just like, we just know what it means. Matrices can implement something that does this. So uh, again, this is well known by now. Uh, Marco Baroni and uh, Zamparelli did a lovely paper, in, I think about ACL 2012. Uh, adject nouns are uh, na nouns are vectors, adjectives, and matrices. Or the title might be the other way around. But if you look up adjectives, nouns, matrices, that's one of the papers you'll find. And and it, the matrix multiplication does a good job of picking the components that matter to it, and so that can be used for disambiguation. Here's a toy domain example. Um, that, so we just have four different topics, places, events, tech and skill. Uh, Borneo is a place, C++ is a tech, a trip is an event, juggling is a skill. Java, I picked as my ambiguous word here, could be both a place and a tech. I, and, and so then let's look at some of the verbs that could be represented as matrices. So visit, for example, takes a place and turns it into an event. If I visit Borneo, then there's an event happening. Right? Similarly, if I learn C++, then I acquire a skill. So somehow learn is taking a technology and turning it into a skill. So that's what these two toy matrices do. That's also what these little circuits do. If I have Java that has activated both the place and the tech axis, and but visit takes a place and says you've got an event, then, oh, what does this circuit do with the tech part of Java? Just completely ignores it. So in the process of composing visit and Java, we've performed the disambiguation. This was, uh, you, not, you won't be at all surprised, this was the trivially easiest thing to code up and run on the quantum computer. Uh, a shout out to, uh, well, I'll show you, actually running it on a quantum computer, or not, well, I can't do that live here, but uh, it would take a little bit too long to queue and come back. But I can do it with this uh, like Kiskit simulation. And so what have I done? Declared a quantum circuit. There's the bit, zero bit, second bit. Connect zero and five. And then I print out the operator. Holy heck, what is this monstrosity? I have no idea what this is telling me. OK, let me try printing out the state vector instead. Let's run that too. Oh my goodness, it just got worse. Uh, I'm saying this, but this is what it feels like using coordinates and NumPy arrays uh, the whole time. I'm mentioning that as part of the quantum development process. I haven't been using diagrams yet, but this is why I should. I'd, um, yeah, um, like, um, ha ha how much time do you spend every day wor worrying about byte ordering? I'm guessing zero in your case, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. 
so things that will make it real over the next couple of years, let's get results, data sets, precision recall, clear comparisons with alternatives, runtime characteristics, how many machines, or which machines, how many shots, how did it actually run? Because uh, people want to know this. And to put it a different way, I often find theoretical papers want to hide that, a lot of the dirty laundry, those zeros and ones I just show you, you're not going to print those in a paper, they're horrible. Practice wants to see the laundry go in dirty and come out clean. So let's, let's be doing that. So where next? To scale, scale, scale. Let's make it bigger. Uh, it's, you know, it's language challenges. Look for problems that are rewarding at intermediate scales. I think there are several. Have to talk about those. And keep trying new circuit models. We're going to be doing this anyway. But it's important because it's a place where applications and hardware can come together and discuss what do we mean you know, when we say things are working or we're getting errors. What do we what do we mean by errors in the sense that so much of computing is figuring out what sources of error, or so much of machine learning is figuring out what sources of error really percolate up to errors that affect users. And, and so, yeah, don't wait. Get involved. Use what we have. Ask where we can help. Big opportunities, big challenges coming up. Thank you again so much. <laughs>